Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, first Saturday talk of the month of July. And I think like that, uh, half a year has gone already. And uh, to start the beginning of the latter part of this year, we have with us uh, Dr. D.P.C.K. Anandalal, a uh, consultant neurosurgeon at the Lady Ritchie Hospital, Colombo. Uh, Dr. Uh, he's known as Dr. Chula. So Dr. Chula is a graduate from uh, Peradin University. And uh, he is a very talented neurosurgeon and he currently is, I think he transferred quite newly after um, spending uh, about three years at the National Candy, Ho Candy Hospital. And uh, he's doing an immense amount of service in this uh, area of neurosurgery. And on a casual note, he is a lover of uh, Indian classical music. And uh, isn't that right? I hope I got those facts right from what I know. So to start on the uh, proper uh, Saturday talk, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Chula to talk about intracranial pressure in clinical practice. Okay, okay, thanks, Nilanka, and thanks, uh, Selene, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I hope everyone can hear, isn't it? Yes, your crystal clear. Yes. Okay, uh, so this is not going to be a formal lecture on intracranial pressure because uh, the topic is quite vast and uh, its uh, basic science is still uh, quite experimental. So essentially, some of the applications in clinical practice even still uh, experimental. So that is why we see so much of variation among different institutions, different neurosurgeons uh, in the management of patients because uh, uh, some, some uh, scientific facts are still not very clear. So it's not going to be too much of theory on this, uh, on basic science, but I certainly stress on some of the applications uh, we commonly used uh, in clinical practice, and I'll explain uh, uh, the uh, scientific principles of intracranial pressure behind those applications, basically. So what is meant by intracranial pressure? Brief uh, 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 introduction. This nothing scientific here. It's just the pressure uh, elicited by the cranial wall by the intracranial content. Uh, but it's important for us to uh, sort of recognize the important contents inside the intracranial pressure because the contribution to intracranial pressure from these different compartments, uh, it varies. Uh, basically, we have meninges, then uh, cerebrospinal fluid, then blood, and then parenchyma. Those are the four main components. And we know the, the, the volume occupied by these uh, different fractions are quite different. So its contribution to intracranial pressure also different, not just the same. And generally, we consider intracranial pressure to be within uh, 10 to 15 millimeter mercury, but this is extremely variable. This is a very rough figure. And as we now do quite a lot of uh, experimental studies using intracranial pressure monitoring, uh, we have recognized there's extreme variation of this. Uh, now, I have seen a patient with intracranial pressure of 6, but she's absolutely fine. And similarly, I have seen another patient with intracranial pressure of 22 or 23, and he was also absolutely fine. And that's actually the pressure which we think of interventions even. So there is extreme individual variation decided by different, different factors. Uh, but we generally consider 10 to 15 as the normal figure uh, in, in our clinical practice. Uh, then there's the important concept that we need to uh, uh, sort of, uh, understand. When it comes to the, uh, uh, the cranial cavity, structurally it's not isolated compartment because it's a continuation with the spinal uh, canal. But if you consider the um, functional wise, it's, it's an isolated compartment. In other words, uh, the, when you have increased intracranial pressure in uh, within the cranium, uh, the pressure inside the spinal canal does not uh, uh, change uh, uh, proportionately. So there's a big variation. So functionally, it's uh, isolated. And uh, when it comes to children, there's another important difference which, we, uh, uh, which is important in clinical practice. Uh, 
in children, uh, skull bones are not fused. Uh, I mean, in very early ages. So the skull can expand. So its volume is actually variable. Whereas in adults, once the old skull sutures are fused, the volume is static. It cannot change. And this has a big uh, uh, impact on cl clinical variability, clinical presentations as well as in, when it comes to the management. So roughly we have 150 milliliters of CSA and more or less equal amount of blood. Uh, then rest of it is brain parenchyma. So vast majority of the volume is occupied by the brain parenchyma. Uh, so you can basically understand that any parenchymal change can contribute a lot uh, towards change in intranasal pressure. And so for something that I haven't uh, mentioned here is the meninges because the contribution of meninges uh, uh, volume wise to intracranial content is minimum if you compare with uh, uh, other structures. We so generally uh, ignore uh, meninges when it comes to uh, structural contribution to intracranial pressure. Uh, then, an important, very simple, but very important neuro uh, principle when it comes to intracranial pressure is the Monroe Kelly doctrine. Now, this very basically it says the skull is a rigid, rigid cavity in adults. Uh, so whenever uh, there's abnormal volume accumulating inside, obviously it brings up the pressure. So if you want to keep the pressure within normal, you have to take some volume out from the intracranial cavity. Uh, uh, that's what basically it says. It's a very simple one, but has a very significant uh, uh, contribution uh, to diagnostic as well as management strategies in, in uh, clinical uh, uh, neurology and neurosurgery practice. Uh, few causes of intracranial pressure. Now, we, uh, I mentioned there are structural contributions from different compartments of the brain. Uh, so, whenever there is abnormally high volume uh, from these uh, normal uh, uh, compartments, it creates increased intracranial pressure. Uh, one common thing is the cerebrospinal fluid, where there is increased production or reduced the reabsorption of CSF, causing accumulation inside. According to Monroe Kelly doctrine, we can understand uh, uh, the pressures go on. That's what we call uh, hydrocephalus. Similarly, similar same thing can happen with blood also, especially with venous congestion. Now, if you have bilateral jugular obstructions, the venous outflow from the cranial cavity is obstructed. So there is some degree of venous tension and that can actually contribute uh, directly as well as indirectly uh, to cause increased intracranial pressure. Indirectly mean if you have venous congestion, CSF reabsorption is, is uh, impaired. So it's indirectly and also so directly also it can contribute because it uh, occupies some volume. Then of course parenchyma, which is probably the most important in most of the situation, that is cerebral edema. You, you get uh, uh, swelling of the normal brain parenchyma and obviously it occupies some abnormal uh, volume uh, inside the cranial cavity. Then you can have abnormal content inside, which is not normally found. This is very common in clinical practice. So you can get uh, uh, hemorrhages in any layer of uh, uh, the uh, cranial content. It can be extradural, it can be subdural, it can be within the subarachnoid space or ventricular uh, cavities or within the parenchyma even. So all these conditions can give rise to uh, increased intracranial pressure directly as well as indirectly. Then of course, the second important thing in clinical uh, neurosurgical practice is tumors. Tumors mean always there is almost always there's a mass effect inside cranial cavity. Uh, so, uh, same thing goes with the abscess and lymphomas, so the infections. Uh, then, of course, uh, rarely, particularly in children, you see there's a reduction of uh, a normal volume. Uh, particularly, you see this in craniosynostosis, that is uh, where there is fusion of the skull bones prematurely. So the skull can't expand, but the brain tries to grow because it's, uh, the glial tissues uh, uh, has some uh, uh, growth uh, cap uh, capacity in, in childhood. Uh, so there's a discrepancy of volume uh, and the uh, uh, volume which is there and volume which is going introduced into the cranial cavity. So that can also cause intracranial pressure. Not very common, but this condition we see quite frequently. Then there are certain conditions. Uh, again, uh, we do see in clinical practice uh, frequently uh, that's normal pressure hydrocephalus and idiopathic intracranial uh, hypertension. Now, those 
two conditions have something to do with intracranial pressure, uh, but the actual, the real contribution is still not fully understood. Uh, what we have found up to now is there is uh, some uh, uh, variation, variability in intracranial pressure in these patients. So they have uh, uh, some degree of increased intracranial pressure time to time, and its pattern is quite different. Those are still being studied. But you have some element of increased intracranial pressure in those conditions also. So when it comes to clinical significance of intracranial pressure, that's probably the most important uh, uh, principle. That despite any primary pathology within the cranial cavity, the real emergency or urgency lies in the uh, intracranial pressure. Because whether it's an infection or abscess, a tumor, or uh, some kind of hemorrhage, uh, patient will deteriorate and patient will die uh, because of the intracranial pressure, not necessarily because of its primary pathology. So that is why uh, the intracranial pressure we consider has to be a clinical diagnosis. And in fact, even the, the management strategies have to be implemented uh, based on the clinical findings. Uh, without waiting for confirmation of the diagnosis because uh, we don't have to really look for the etiology or the primary pathology if the patient has features of increased intracranial pressure because that's non-specific expression of the intracranial pathology and that's what kills the patient. So that's what we really uh, worry about at least uh, uh, in the management of initial period. Uh, so almost all the cranial pathologies uh, can present with this. Uh, so the diagnosis is clinical. So most of the features are very non-specific. But in the history, if there is any suspicion of any kind of cerebral insult, you can suspect increased intracranial pressure if the relevant clinical features are there. Uh, in examination, again, most of the findings are non-specific, but something that we uh, would prefer looking at whenever possible is the papal edema, because when there's increased intracranial pressure, almost always it's transmitted into the uh, orbital compartment and that's what you see as papilidine. So those two things are important in the clinical assessment despite the primary pathology. So we don't have to bother about uh, finding the primary pathology. And then of course, if you really want to find more clues, then you can do uh, imaging. What we do in adult is uh, the non-contrast CT brain. Uh, as the first line investigation, but in children where there there's uh, patent uh, fontanelle, we can even use ultrasound to see if there's evidence of increased intracranial pressure. Uh, and of course, you will see uh, sometime the, the primary pathology too. Uh, then of course, if you really want to objectively find the intracranial pressure, uh, that is again available in clinical practice. That's the objective monitoring of intracranial pressure that facilities available with us. Uh, uh, both national hospitals uh, got that facility and I think even the outstation and neurosurgical centers now uh, have these facilities at least to a lesser degree. Uh, and these are two methods <laughs> where intracranial pressure monitoring is uh, detection is done objectively. Uh, we commonly use two methods. There are different ways. Uh, we use either parenchymal bold, the what you see here, uh, this gives you a digital value of uh, intracranial pressure. It's a, it's a software, it's a program. Uh, or else we can do simple manometry uh, uh, to uh, check the pressure uh, using a CSF, which we call external ventricular drainage. And just a little uh, fact, if you go for extra ventricular drainage, that has a therapeutic value also, because if the patient is uh, having intra high intracranial pressure, we can take some CSF out uh, as part of the management. But in, when it comes to world, we can't do this. Uh, this, this of course, can be done uh, and has to be done also uh, in neurosurgical centers. So in, for primary physicians, uh, it's not of any practical value. So the management of uh, ICP, I will probably uh, discuss it later uh, once uh, we go into more details. Uh, then a little bit about basic science in relation to intracranial pressure and its clinical significance. Now, the, what really matters in the viability of brain is the cerebral perfusion. How much of uh, oxygen is coming into the brain and the waste products are being removed. So it's basically uh, uh, what you see in cerebral perfusion. Uh, 
uh, and it's basically the parenchyma. Uh, so if you consider cerebral perfusion pressure uh, in relation to uh, the mean arterial pressure, that's the, the pressure uh, caused by the, your, uh, your vascular system on uh, blood coming into the brain and the actual intracranial pressure, uh, your cerebral perfusion pressure is deti determined by those two, the balance be between those two. <clears throat> so generally, uh, in a healthy adult, the mean arterial pressure is around 90. And if you consider the intracranial pressure as 15, uh, your actual cerebral perfusion pressure is around 65. This is why in most of the situations, uh, we, we if we have facilities to monitor this, we would prefer keeping the cerebral perfusion pressure minimum of 65 because that's the, that, that level of cerebral perfusion is adequate enough to prevent any hypoxemic injury. But of course, there are certain situations where we need to give a better perfusion by give, uh, going into a higher cerebral perfusion pressure. That depends on how much of mean anterior pressure and how much of intracranial pressure is there at that particular moment. Uh, so this is the relationship. And we have around 150 milliliter of blood uh, an arterial uh, less or just like in other organs and uh, what I want to uh, mention here is if you uh, take the whole blood volume uh, vast majority of this is actually within the microcirculation. Uh, this is why we now give a very high priority even in the clinical management to make sure that the microcirculation is intact. Uh, because uh, if the microcirculation is dysfunctioning, even if you have uh, uh, adequate arterial flow with the cerebral perfusion pressure, your brain is not going to be uh, uh, perfused properly. Uh, just a fact, because uh, these are being now investigated and uh, we are uh, having quite a lot of new findings, which has a clinical uh, impact. So uh, microcirculation is a very important uh, uh, area. Uh, when it comes to cerebral insult. Basically, now, uh, in most of the time, it's experimental still, but there are few clinical uh, centers uh, um, at the moment in the world where microcirculatory features are also being monitored in neurosurgical practice because what we generally measure is the blood pressure, venous outflow, intracranial pressure, pressure and all. But there are certain patients who still deteriorate despite maintaining all these uh, big parameters. The reason for that is some of them have, uh, have uh, microcirculatory dysfunctions. So you might see in literature, they are talking about uh, these concepts also. Now. Uh, then uh, I said, basically what matters is the oxygen consumption and you keep normal required oxygen consumption level by keeping your cerebral blood flow within normal uh, uh, using uh, uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure. And of course, if there's any disturbance for this mechanism, uh, causing cutoff of uh, blood circulation, uh, including microcirculation. Uh, neurons can die within roughly around four to six uh, minutes time. So this is why time is a very important factor when it comes to uh, intracranial pressure. And this time uh, period is also quite variable, but we generally uh, expect that to be four to within four to six minutes. Otherwise, you get some degree of irreversible uh, cerebral uh, ischemia. Uh, so effects of ICP, uh, it's intracranial pressure, but your uh, clinical picture evolved basically on three arms. So you get basically clinical features and effects due to pressure itself. Then there's another category of uh, clinical features and effects due to ischemia. And uh, the third category is uh, due to herniation. Uh, so we will go into these uh, three uh, in detail next because it's quite important in clinical practice. The first, uh, the first category of clinical features in intracranial pressure is it's due to pressure itself. Now we know when it's come to brain parenchyma, there are no innervation. Now other organs has a neural innervation to detect stimuli, but in brain parenchyma, uh, to a vast major uh, major extent. Uh, there is no innervation, so there is no sensing it. But there are certain structures within the brain, uh, the cranial cavity, where there is innervation. The, the well-known uh, structural component is the dura. Dura is heavily innervated uh, uh, by uh, sensory fibers, uh, and it can detect the pressure. Uh, 
Now, only thing is that the cerebral plasticity is such that the increased intracranial pressure is perceived by the uh, 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 perception areas of the brain as pain, pain in the sense headache. Now, when this headache is transmitted by C fibers, if you can remember basic uh, neurophysiology, the sharp, fast uh, uh, pain is conducted by uh, bigger myelinated fibers. But most of the dural innervation is a small unmyelinated fibers. Uh, and though there are nerve endings are also not free nerve endings which detects nerve. Some of them say it's the de detection is actually some structure, something similar to Pacinian. Uh, so there is some some difference when it comes to pain science in dura, but whatever it is, the dura stretch stimulates these receptors and afferent fibers, and the pain that you get is the dull, non-localizing pain. That's what you uh, get with pain fiber, uh, pain coming from C fibers. So let's say um, if someone call me and say there's a patient with a head injury and the patient is complain of, complaining of severe pain in, a, uh, in one point or well localized area, then I know that patient's headache is not due to intra increased intracranial pressure because there's a localized sharp pain means some, something different. It's probably local injury. But whereas if a patient has a generalized headache, and uh, uh, cannot rec uh, localize to a particular area, uh, then that is quite likely to be uh, uh, the pain or headache you get with increased intracranial pressure. So that's what you need to know. Severe localized pain is not due to increased intracranial pressure because we don't have large myelinated fibers in the waiting dura. Uh, then uh, this particular headache is generally increased when you put the head down. Generally, there are instances where there has to be absolutely opposite happens. Uh, the, the reason for this is if you put your head down, there's venous congestion. And I said venous congestion itself can add into uh, increased intracranial pressure directly as well as indirectly. Uh, so this is generally aggravated. And uh, if the patient vomits, this uh, this gets real. What happens when you vomit, there is carbon dioxide wash out. We know the cerebral uh, vasculature is very sensitive to carbon dioxide. If you have more carbon dioxide uh, uh, in brain parenchyma or CSA, the blood vessels are dilated. So there is contribution to increase intracranial pressure. Whereas if you wash out the carbon dioxide uh, and get rid of some, uh, uh, sorry, it's, it's something to do with the acid base balance also, but I won't go into that. So you get some relief with uh, uh, vomiting. So those are features of headache uh, uh, with increased intracranial pressure. And uh, of course, patient can complain of visual disturbances due to pressure itself because this pressure can be directly transmitted to visual apparatus. We know even the uh, part of the optic nerve is within the cranial cavity. So obviously the pressure can have some direct effects. And even I say the pressure can be in fact transmitted through the arachnoid extension into eye itself. So there can be some ocular pressure and the ocular structures are well innervated by pain fibers. So you can have visual disturbance and uh, eye pain. And of course, papillary my already mentioned. Uh, so those are the features due to uh, pressure itself. Then there are a different uh, set of clinical features uh, due to ischemia and herniation. We'll be going into details next. So cerebral ischemia, uh, so uh, one uh, uh, important arm of uh, pathophysiology of increased intracranial pressure is cerebral ischemia. We'll be going into details in uh, uh, next few slides, but uh, just few things in relation to clinical features that you get with cerebral ischemia. Again, you can get headache, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, the mechanism of this is being extensively studied by uh, basic neuroscience uh, uh, scientists. Uh, what we generally, uh, there's nothing much, I think, related to uh, the clinical practice except the drugs that we use uh, to prevent these symptoms. Uh, but the mechanisms, were, uh, I think, vast, uh, great extent, still not known. What we know is it's basically due to the ischemia into reticular formation. So the reticular formation is it's a, it's it's an important structure in the brain, which of course regulate quite a lot of functions. And uh, ischemia of that particular structure can give rise to all these, especially uh, nausea and vomiting. 
then of course, obviously, you get alteration of consciousness, uh, uh, which we call ischemic encephalopathy. Basically, your neurons to be functional, you need adequate oxygen. If the oxygen is not there, because we don't have oxygen reservoirs in the neurons. So once that uh, threshold is reached, your neurons are not going to conduct the electricity, basically. So it's not going to function. So you get alteration of consciousness, consciousness due to ischemia. Then you can get convulsions due to ischemia. That's also well studied. Uh, that has a big therapeutic effect because for some of the anti-epileptics that we use actually act through these mechanisms. So basically what happens is we have uh, ischemia sensitive calcium channels which opens up and some closed up. So there is imbalance in calcium. Uh, this is not the only mechanism, but we have some therapeutic targets based on this. Then, of course, we can get cardiovascular changes. Again, we know the very lower uh, 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 component segment of the reticuli uh, has our uh, respiratory and cardio cardiac centers in, in very simple terms uh, in the medulla. So, ischemia to these uh, areas uh, obviously going to cause some cardiorespiratory changes. We will see those changes later. And then, of course, the latter part of the uh, uh, disease progression, you might see pupillary changes due to brainstem ischemia. Uh, basically, this is due to, we know our pupil disease has the uh, parasympathetic as well as sympathetic innervation. And the parasympathetic innervation comes from uh, adding a vesicle nuclei of the vagus, uh, which lies in the lower part of the brainstem. So if you have brainstem ischemia, uh, there is uh, lack of uh, proper parasympathetic innovation. So you will see dilated and fixed uh, pupils. So, but that's too late when you see that. Then, of course, the ischemia, if ischemia persists for, for a long time or to a higher uh, degree, severity wise, then, of course, at some point, the neurons will die, which we call irreversible cerebral ischemia. Then you see all the clinical features that you see in the infarction, depending on the area of infarction. This is just an illustration to show uh, how I, I think uh, uh, it's important for all the medical personnel to be quite familiar with non contrast CT brains because that's like uh, available uh, within quite reasonable time in everywhere in Sri Lanka now. Now, what you see here in the right uh, here is the uh, some degree of opacity, uh, hypodensity. This area of chemia is reversible. Whereas uh, if it's progress to this intensity, uh, it's irreversible. So this is basically going into infarction. Here is ischemia. You can see if you can compare with the normal site, uh, there's a difference. Just if you are interested in knowing. Then the third category of symptoms are due to herniation. Herniation means I said the uh, brain is not structurally... Uh, uh, it's actually within the cranial cavity there is some degree of compartmentalization uh, because of neural folds, particularly the falx cerebri, which uh, uh, separates two hemispheres, and the tentorium cerebelli, which separates the uh, cerebellum from the uh, other component. So if you have a localized rising pressure, obviously the, uh, the contents of within that uh, arbitrary compartment can shift to the other, uh, which we call herniation. So you have uh, three important types of herniation that you see uh, depending on the location of the pathology. The first thing is you, you can get a hemisphere pushing uh, uh, towards the other side uh, underneath the falls, which we call trans, uh, sorry, subfalcine herniation. So there are different set of clinical symptoms and signs that you might see with this particular herniation. Then the next herniation is uh, the transtentorial, that is the lowermost part of the temporal, it's lower medial segment of the temporal lobe, can be pushed down if you have pressure upstairs, which we call the ankle herniation, so medial temporal herniation. Again, you have a different set of uh, clinical features that you will see with this. Then if you have a generalized increase in uh, pressure, uh, we know the only, uh, oops, only uh, uh, significant outflow the, or the corridor comes uh, from the foramen magnum, which goes into the spinal uh, uh, canal. So if you have high pressure uh, within the cranial cavity, which is generalized, uh, the only way is 
to get rid of fresh air is to for the brain to be pushed down through the foramen magna, which is the uh, which we uh, recognize as corning in clinical practice, and this is the worst uh, uh, herniation that you will see. And again, you have different clinical symptoms and signs uh, uh, with this particular uh, pathological process, which we'll see in, uh, later. So I have just listed down different uh, uh, clinical symptoms and signs that you see uh, based on different uh, locations of herniation. So I think I wouldn't go into detail of this is anyone can read it. <laughs> so I want to uh, tell a little bit about this particular uh, pathological process is corning because this is important to recognize as uh, as I said, this is the real emergency in neurosurgical practice. And I think it's not very technical and every uh, medical personnel uh, should be able to detect this on imaging, imaging in the sense non-contrast CT. So what you look for it, I said, now what happens in Pony is your whole brain get pushed into the uh, spinal canal through the foramen magnum in very simple words. So if you take a CT scan and go down to the lowermost cut of the, uh, the cranial CT uh, to locate the foramen magnum, you should see the medulla oblongata here and the two tonsils, which are uh, the, the, the most inferior located structures in the cerebellum, two tonsils uh, sitting uh, posterolaterally on either side. So this is the normal anatomy, radiological anatomy you see. And you will see a black color ring, uh, black color space separating these three structures. Now, these black color areas indicate CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. And if you have black color uh, areas intact, that means your normal cerebrospinal fluid uh, uh, is retained there. It's retained there. What happens if you have high pressure pushing the cranial content down? Uh, obviously, the CSF will displace down. So you will not see a black color space separating these three structures at the level of the paramen magnum. Now, in, now here you can see there is no CSF seen. So this is what we radiologically recognize as phony. And you see, uh, if you if you really want to uh, recognize, appreciate that fact, you see now the medulla is here. Two tonsils are here, and if you see medulla is too blackish, then your tonsils on either side. Now here it's whitish. Now here it's blackish. So this is what happened with the corning. So you have cranial content pushing down, causing so much of pressure into the medulla, and this is the area where you have your cardiorespiratory centers. So that is why uh, when it comes to the stage of corning, you see all the cardiorespiratory failure. Uh, clinical features because your brain stem is not going to function and this is the place where uh, you see uh, 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 the vagal uh, start, uh, starting point of, point of the vagal uh, uh, output basically the edinger nuclei so those are now going to be ischemic so that is why at this stage you will see uh, your bilateral pupils are dilated and fixed because there is no parasympathetic output going there uh, so you, so if you see this particular CT in a patient whose cardiorespiratory parameters are abnormal and uh, uh, the pupils are dilated and fixed and the uh, patient is unconscious, then your diagnosis of corning, clinical diagnosis of corning is very likely to be correct. And that's very important because when you communicate with a neurosurgeon or a, even a neurologist, some, something that we always look for is whether there are any features of impending corning or established corning. If it is impending corning, we urgently get them down because this is going to be surgical. Whereas it is, if it is established corning, uh, where there is significant cardiorespiratory failure, we might say there's no point in sending this patient to a neurosurgical unit because patient is going to invariably drop because the most important area of the brain is the ischemic now and it's going into irreversible ischemia. So I think this particular radiological picture, along with those clinical details I said, uh, have to be recognized by any medical personnel uh, because it makes uh, 
the management of neurosurgical uh, or neurological patients quite easier. Uh, especially, we can save resources uh, by uh, not doing unnecessary interventions and transfers if you can correctly communicate this clinical picture to uh, tertiary care clinicians. Uh, this is just to illustrate how you get those cardiorespiratory abnormalities when there is spawning. I'm not going to explain those uh, here. And this is how you get uh, fixed dilated pupils when you have horny. Uh, then I'll, uh, going into probably most important area in relation to uh, clinical practice, uh, how does brain tackle ICP? So if you consider all the organs in the body, all the organs uh, have some uh, mechanism, uh, protective mechanisms to be protected from ischemia and insult. And I don't think any other organ has uh, such an intelligent uh, intrinsic mechanisms of tackling those problems uh, come, uh, like brain uh, because it has many very finely regulated uh, uh, protective mechanisms being operated. And of course, uh, on the other hand, those are very sensitive also. It can go wrong quite easily and it can decompensate also quite easily. But the mechanisms are very... Uh, strategically uh, linked and quite advanced if you compare with the, uh, the protective mechanism that you see in other organs. So uh, making it very simple, what happens is when you have, it's basically the operation of Monroe-Kelly doctrine. So you have increased intracranial pressure for some reason. So the first simple thing that the brain is trying to do is to send out some volume from the cranial cavity to keep the pressure normal. That's what the Monroe Kelly has told. Uh, so the brain has the intelligent mechanism to pull, uh, uh, put out the least important uh, component inside the intracranial cavity. So relatively least important uh, uh, component inside the cranial cavity uh, is the CSA because you can take out almost all the CSA without causing much clinical uh, deterioration of the patient. So brain is doing that first. So when you go on doing that, after some time, it's, if it is not enough, the brain decides to put out the next least important volume. That is venous blood. Uh, this, of course, we can't uh, remove all the venous blood. It's going to cause circulatory insufficiency. But to a certain extent, the brain can handle that. So when that also goes to some time, then the brain has to send out restrict arterial blood coming in to keep the pressure. Now, this is quite serious because whenever the arterial flow is cut off or uh, restricted to brain, that's going to, of course, it's it's happening uh, to keep the pressure normal, but that, of course, was going to uh, ischemic injury. There are other problems start. So that's what we call compensated versus decompensated phase, depending on which to which extent the arterial flow, flow is being restricted uh, inside the cranial cavity. I will explain it later. Then, of course, the last thing, uh, last thing to go send out is the uh, most important thing which you need to uh, keep inside the cranial cavity. That's the brain parenchyma. That's what happens in the pony. So, brain finally decides to put the uh, himself out to keep the uh, intracranial pressure intact, making it quite simple to understand, uh, but the, using very non-scientific terms. So that's the terminal stage, which we call pony. And by this time, of course, as I explained previously, uh, it's very likely unsalvageable. So this is the basic mechanism uh, within the cranial cavity to handle intracranial pressure before neurosurgeons or neurologists or whoever do anything. <laughs> A little bit of cerebral perfusion and ischemia. I think I will skip this. It's... It's basically the uh, what we have learned in our physiology. Uh, just a little thing uh, uh, about this particular hemodynamic change uh, you see uh, with the uh, increase in intracranial pressure. That's uh, important to understand because it has a diagnostic as well as of course decision making uh, significance. So to keep the so idea is of all these protective mechanism is to keep the cerebral blood flow adequate enough to uh, uh, give enough oxygen. Uh, 
And how does this brain do this? Is uh, uh, by uh, keeping the cerebral perfusion pressure in. So what happens is when you, uh, you uh, brain try to increase the mean arterial pressure so that uh, it pro pro provides more cerebral perfusion pressure when the uh, intracranial pressure is high, the basic principle I told you before. But what happens is uh, when the ICP uh, increases, uh, this, is detect this has some compromisation of the cerebral circulation. So the brain ischemia, very early degree of brain ischemia is detected immediately by the vasomotor centers, particularly in the brain stem. And these vasomotor centers stimulate the parasympathetic output as a protective mechanism to bring up the blood pressure. Uh, so we know we have sympathetic outflow into our blood vessels as well as the heart. So heart will start functioning more, heart rate will go up. Uh, so there will be tachycardia, in, increased strength of contraction. And meanwhile, the, the peripheral blood vessels will constrict. So your blood pressure will go up and the mean arterial pressure will increase, providing more cerebral perfusion pressure. But what happens is, when this happens, the increased systemic pressure is detected by baroreceptors in your uh, carotids and uh, aortic arch. And those signals will be conveyed into brain stem uh, via glossopharyngeal and vagal afferents. And that goes and stimulates the parasympathetic outflow. So parasympathetic outflow, we have only into heart. There is no parasympathetic outflow to our blood vessels. So previously we had tachycardia and increased contractility. Now the parasympathetic is coming to heart and asking the heart to slow down. So there will be relatively bradycardia now and the less strength of contraction, but nothing will happen to your blood vessels. So what happened compared to previous stage, your blood pressure still will uh, stay high, but the heart rate will drop down. So you will see some degree of hypertension with bradycardia. Initially you had hypertension with tachycardia. Now this particular phenomena is called Cushing's reflex because this was described first by uh, the Sir William Harvey Cushing, who is considered the uh, father of neurosurgery because he has described quite a lot of uh, important principles that we he use even uh, today in clinical practice. And this is something that we always want primary physician to recognize whether the patient is in Cushing's or not. And we know the initial period of Cushing's <laughs> It's quite transient most of the time. You have hyperactive circulation. You see hypertension, tachycardia. But established Cushing, so you have hypertension with bradycardia. So it's important to recognize these two stages. And what happens is now this uh, Cushing reflex is it's, it's completely a compensatory mechanism. So once this happens, this all the whole biological phenomena. Uh, have some restrictions. It can't go on forever. So once this reach a particular threshold, when there is significant brainstem ischemia, uh, uh, you are, uh, none of the sympathetic or parasympathetic outflows are going to function properly, which means you are going to get a, a, a complete circulatory failure. Uh, that happens once the established pushings also uh, pass. So at that when that happens, what you see is hypotension with bradycardia. Basically, your cardiovascular system has collapsed. So at this stage, there is no Cushing's. It has, Cushing's has actually failed. That is terminal. And that stage, we don't uh, get, uh, despite whatever the neurosurgical emergency that you see in your imaging, we ask uh, the primary team not to send those patients to neurosurgical centers because they are invariably dying. Because the whole brain, uh, the whole compensatory mechanisms have failed. So these three stages in a patient who is suspected or diagnosed to have ICP is important for any medical personnel to recognize the, the circulatory uh, parameters. So first use, first stage is tachycardia hypertension. Next stage is bradycardia hypertension. Third stage is bradycardia hypotension. Uh, so that's why, uh, apart from GCS, uh, we always want the, uh, the person who is referring, uh, making the neurosurgical referral to give us these hemodynamic parameters uh, 
because that help us to recognize which stage of uh, compensation or decompensation uh, is there within the patient. That's important for the management. So that's a bit about Cushing's. Uh, okay. And the other thing is now you can see the Cushing's occurs uh, when there are cerebral ischemia, there has to be some degree of cerebral insult uh, for pushing to start. So, if you see now, if you have some degree of cerebral ischemia, I said at the beginning, you are you are you can't be fully conscious because your neurons, to a certain extent, is not going to function. Yeah. Give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. I'm sorry about it. Uh, so what happened is, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember now. All right, okay. So okay, fine. So what I said is, so even for the pushings to start, pushing reflex to start, there has to be some degree of cerebral ischemia. And if there is some degree of cerebral ischemia, you can't have a patient who is fully conscious because uh, some of your consciousness uh, uh, maintaining neurons going to be dysfunctional. Uh, so if, if somebody call me and say, we have urgent neurosurgical referral, and I ask why, and they say, uh, this is something that we commonly encounter. That's why I'm telling. A patient has features of pushing reflex. So when I ask, oh, why do you say pushing reflex? They say they are hypertension and bradycardia. Then I ask, what's the GCS? And sometimes my answer I get is the GCS is 50. The moment someone says GCS 50, I know that is not pushing. Because you can't have a patient with pushing reflex, especially second stage of pushing, that's uh, hypertension with bradycardia. That means there is invariable component of cerebral ischemia in the patient and his reticuli or cortical sentence cannot function 100% perfectly. So if you have a patient with hypertension and bradycardia, even, the, even if the patient has uh, imaging evidence of intracranial pathology, that's not pushing if GCS is 50 because you can't have a patient uh, uh, whose uh, compensation uh, ischemia is there at least to a certain degree with properly functioning neuron. So when you before you diagnose pushing reflex, you need to uh, uh, recognize the level of consciousness. It cannot be 15. It can be 14. The patient has to be at least drowsy. It's generally more than that, but at least that as there is a significant variation, but he cannot be fully conscious. That's not pushing. Uh, this is just to illustrate how the brain uh, uh, keeps its blood flow uh, uh, within a fixed range uh, despite the variation of uh, uh, mean arterial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, this particular phenomena is only seen in cerebral circulation. Other organs, if there is more blood pressure, more blood flow. Uh, if there is less blood pressure, less, less blood flow. But brain is not so. Uh, a, a massive uh, range, like from 15 to 150 millimeter mercury, your blood pressure remains uh, stable, which we call autoregulation. And this, this is how the brain tries to keep its oxygen uh, uh, supply uh, intact despite increased intracranial pressure. So I'm not. This is also extremely uh, studied uh, to a very fine uh, scientific levels because it has, uh, people are developing part of uh, treatment strategy, therapeutic strategies based on this. I'm not going to explain all this here. Yeah. This is also just an illustration of uh, how this uh, uh, cerebral blood flow is maintained within, within this period. So if you have uh, 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 blood pressure below a threshold, uh, then there has there is less blood supply means less ischemia. When there is hyperperfusion, is also the same can happen because blood just flow without uh, uh, maintaining the proper perfusion. So both are uh, insulted. These are all those mechanisms which are being studied uh, by basic neuroscientists. This illustration of pushings. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, this is probably the most important area that I want to uh, elaborate uh, as the last stage of the lecture. So I said now that now this ICP rising any intracranial pathology is not not sort of uh, uh, stage wise mutually uh, exclusive. I mean it, it, it overlaps. But for descriptive purposes, we uh, categorize uh, the intracranial pressure into four phases, the evolution of intracranial pressure into four phases. And those values are also very much arbitrary. I, I said even to begin with, there's extreme variation of these. Uh, so these values are quite arbitrary, but for academic purposes and understanding purposes, I have uh, uh, sort of uh, recognized these values uh, as mentioned here. But if textbooks say some other value, it's no one's fault. It's just this is just for the understanding. So first phase of increased intracranial pressure, then I said that the normal pressure is 10 to 15, so up to 20, roughly up to 20. This figure can be 18 in one book and 22 in another book, so it doesn't matter. So I just consider this as 20 for my own understanding and teaching purposes. Uh, so up to uh, uh, 20. Uh, roughly uh, this uh, uh, first stage um, is there. So what happened in this particular stage is your brain is compliant, which means your brain, the cranial cavity, can accommodate some extra volume without uh, uh, bringing up, uh, without compromising its uh, function, without creating more ischemia. Because it uh, particularly what happens is uh, you probably brain probably send out CSF out to keep the pressure uh, uh, intact because CSF is the least important, I said. So this is what happens uh, at this stage. Uh, so you don't see any cerebral ischemia here. Uh, uh, so the uh, ischemic stimulation is not there. So hemodynamics are normal or maybe very minimum changes. And the cerebral blood flow, cerebral perfusion pressures are all maintained in this stage. And the, uh, uh, all the compensatory mechanisms are intact. Uh, so you will see very little clinical features, probably some headache, maybe a little bit of uh, nausea because of slight uh, increase in pressure, but not much uh, uh, symptoms due to ischemia and you cannot have uh, symptoms due to herniation because uh, the uh, pressure is still at the very, uh, very first stage. And uh, if you assess the patient, your patient is either fully conscious or maybe little drowsy, what we call GCS. 14 to 15. That's what we generally uh, get uh, when we get information from our patients. So if the GC is 14 to 15 is probably uh, in the first stage of increased intracranial pressure. And at this stage, the management is conservative. That means you don't really need a neurosurgical center for this particular management. But of course, I think most of these patients, it's quite rational to come to a neurosurgical center for imaging purposes. So what's meant by uh, conservative management is you use all your basic principles to implement your uh, 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 non-invasive, uh, easily uh, uh, practicable uh, uh, measures, like head elevation. If you head elevate the head, the venous congestion drops, so you uh, get rid of some pressure. And of course, uh, if you have full bladder, if you have, uh, if the patient is in uh, severe constipation, all those things can increase intra-abdominal pressure, which is transmitted to uh, intravena cable pressure, uh, and it can uh, contribute to ICP ultimately. So that is why we are asked patients to be catheterized, uh, give laxatives, and all these. Then, of course, uh, the important thing is to uh, keep the patient sedated and pain-free. Because all these uh, stressful, uh, even emotional stress and pain activate your reticular system and that can cause a hyperdynamic circulation, which in, uh, uh, in, uh, in turn can contribute to intracranial pressure. Because if your mean arterial pressure goes up, uh, your ICP also can go up uh, because those are linked. Uh, so all these conservative measures can be implemented at this particular stage. Uh, and this can be done by all the primary physicians. And this has to be done on suspicion of inter increased intracranial pressure. You don't need the definitive diagnosis. So when it comes to stage T, uh, two uh, 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 intracranial pressure, I would probably consider this to be intracranial pressure between 20 to 25. It, it can vary, as I said, but we'll just consider at that level. 
And at this stage, the brain is less compliant because uh, uh, probably almost all the possible CSF has gone out and some of the venous blood are now going out through uh, bilateral jugular outflows. Uh, and still compensated, but it's worse than the first stage. And at this stage, patient is going to be symptomatic because pressures are pretty high and uh, you have some compromisation of uh, cerebral uh, circulation. So ICP itself mechanically compressed venous compartment and there is mechanical compression of arteries reducing the blood flow in. So there is some degree of ischemia at this stage, but the ischemia at this stage is generally completely reversible. That's the importance. Uh, then uh, this particular ischemia is now will be detected by uh, 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 the uh, vasomotor centers, uh, centers and your pushings will start. So what happens at the first stage, you get hypertension, tachycardia, high, hyper, uh, sorry, your uh, breathing is uh, quite fast to take oxygen. So all those things happen. So if you say, uh, uh, then of course, uh, obviously the GCS will be low because there is some degree of ischemia now. And generally, according to my experience and what is mentioned in uh, literature, as well as what I have seen in experimental studies, which are published in basic neuroscience research, generally the consciousness will be around 14 to 12, uh, which means there is significant compromisation of cerebral function. Uh, uh, so at this stage, there will be, uh, as I said, hemodynamic changes too, but not fully established Cushing's. You will see hyperdynamic circulation uh, in an attempt to provide more blood. So basically, the brain is attempting to keep the cerebral perfusion intact. So even this stage, the, uh, it's compensated uh, intracranial pressure. So at this stage, of course, you need to implement medical management. Uh, so basically, medical management, I'm not going to go into details, but as we commonly use, we go for hyper smaller therapy, we know mannitol and uh, uh, hypertonic salines are being commonly used now. Uh, then these are depending on the situation, actually, but the suspicion of the cause, because it's not going to work for everything. Uh, for example, if it is cerebral edema, uh, uh, or both of these going to work, mannitol and hypertonic saline. In uh, then, the, if the cerebral edema is vasogenic, uh, there is a place for steroid. Now, vasogenic edema you get with tumors uh, uh, and uh, infection, so there is a place for steroids, uh, but not with not for cytotoxic edema. Now, in trauma, you get cytotoxic edema, so there is no place for steroids in trauma. Uh, then, of course, your ICP is high due to increase uh, cerebral spinal fluid production or reabsorption, then you can block CSF production by giving acetazolamide. So those are medical uh, uh, treatments that we com commonly implement to manage uh, ICP. And these things have to come apart from those conservative measures uh, when it reaches the second stage. This is just an illustration of the second stage, how you get ischemia. Then the third stage, uh, I would consider at this stage, uh, probably the intracranial pressure is 20 to 30. 25 to 30, roughly. Uh, and at this stage, now probably the, the all the uh, info, um, unwanted stuff has gone out. And then if you send anything out from the cranial cavity, that would be arterial blood and uh, brain parenchyma. And that's going to be very serious because if you restrict uh, arterial blood, brain is going to be reversible ischemic and infarcted. And of course, if the brain is going out, that means corny. So this phase is going to be the decompensating phase of increased intracranial pressure because the compliance is lost now. And now you see compensatory mechanisms are starting to fail. And at this stage only you will see the fully established Cushing's, that is hypertension with bradycardia. So uh, CP, uh, uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is brought to the maximum by I mean, arterial pressure and it's go can't go 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 go, go beyond that. Uh, so basically, you are uh, pushing is now operating at maximum level. So if you consider ICP, let's say cerebral perfusion uh, somewhere around 150, and the ICP has gone to 25, you need to have at least mean arterial pressure of uh, uh, 175. So you should have uh, high blood pressure with bradycardia. Uh, 
and sometimes uh, another common phenomenon uh, in RF breath, uh, if uh, we get information saying that the patient has evidence of pushing. So when I ask what the blood pressure, sometimes it's 150 uh, by 90, 80. And that's very unlikely to be Cushing's because we, uh, you see here, at least the ICP has to reach 25. Uh, and at that level, to, for you to keep uh, um, cerebral blood flow intact, I said it can go up to 150 maximum. So let's say even if you have reached the maximum, it will be 150 for, for plus 25 which means 175. So a minimum it has to be 175 for you to definitely say it's Cushing's. So what I generally think is um, below 160 of uh, systolic pressure, it's very unlikely to be uh, Cushing's even if it is hypertension and bradycardia. So pressure has to be very much high. Of course, there's a little exception for this. The, this depends on the pre-existing blood pressure of the patient. If, if some if the patient has very low pre-existing blood pressure for reason, even 150, 160 uh, did indicate pushing. So I don't think uh, it's a very strict statement to make, but generally it has to be high. Uh, so you see the global cerebral ischemia and now you get ski irreversible ischemia coming into a uh, uh, picture. And generally the GCS will be less than 12. Uh, 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 most of the time we experience uh, GCS of less than 12 when the patients uh, reach this particular stage. It's actually much lower than that. And at this stage, your uh, medical and conservative management plus surgical management needs to be implemented because this is the uh, last chance to save the patient with the increased intracranial pressure because he's decompensating now. So that is why if the patient has evidence of intracranial pressure and you say there is evidence of pushings and that's reliable, we immediately accept them to neurosurgical theatres uh, for surgical management. So most of the time they need surgery. So what we do is, I, depending on the primary pathology, of course, because the, at this stage, the patient needs to have imaging to find out what the primary pathology is. So, so if there's a blood clot, we have to take it out. If there's significant hydrocephalus, we drain the CSF out. Uh, or we do a decompressive craniectomy. So uh, always we try to uh, respect Monroe and Kelly doctrine, basically. Uh, and of course, there is a place for non-surgical management too. Uh, if we suppress metabolism of the brain, of course, uh, uh, with the available self-perfusion, there is some chance uh, for the brain to survive. This we uh, this is not very popular, but if there is contraindication for invasive uh, uh, techniques, or even if the after invasive uh, strategies, still uh, if the patient is failing, uh, we can implement those uh, uh, high-end uh, metabolic suppressions at this stage. We generally go for barbiturate coma, but in some centers they are trying uh, extremely hypertonic saline, like twenty percent saline uh, in uh, bolus. Uh, in fact, they say that can actually bring down this uh, intracranial pressure equal to uh, uh, what you get in the decompressive craniectomy. But the complications are quite high. But those are the management strategies you will see in neurosurgical practice if the patient is coming in this particular stage. So the last stage is the decompensated phase. Now, uh, once if you can't do anything, if you haven't done anything at stage three, this is what happened. So at this stage, generally ICPs are much higher. It's generally almost always about 30 and no compliance at all. And only protective mechanism, uh, only, only compensatory mechanism to bring down at least a little bit of ICP is to send the brain out from the cranial cavity, which we call coning. So this is what's going to happen at this stage. And uh, at this stage, you have irreversible ischemia to a significant extent, including the brainstem ischemia. So the pushings will fail now. Pushings can't uh, operate now. So you will see at this stage, bradycardia with hypotension and patient's breathing is not adequate enough. Basically, your brain medulla uh, outflow to your cardiorespiratory system is not adequate enough. Brain has completely failed. So you see bradycardia, hypotension, circulatory failure. And there is global ischemia, coning, and GCS is invariably less than 8. You can't have a patient at this stage having GCS above 8. That's impossible. It's much, it's generally GCS 3 actually. And pupils are paralyzed. 
uh, uh, fixed and dilated, then ultimately patient will go into cardiorespiratory arrest. And uh, this is what happened. And if, 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 if the patient is in established decompensated phase, it's very unlikely for neurosurgeons to accept this patient to a neurosurgical center despite having operable intracranial pathology in imaging. I know quite a lot of primary physicians become very unhappy when we give this decision, but we are implementing this particular management strategy at this stage because it's worthless, because patient is going to invariably die or there's a little chance that the patient can still survive, but completely vegetative. I don't think, particularly at this stage in this country, even GCS 15 people cannot live properly. So I don't think uh, anyone should support uh, managing actively uh, this type of patient because it's going to cause a burden for the whole healthcare system. So the management in standard developed world for this at this stage is uh, uh, the uh, 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 brainstem testing uh, and uh, active palliation which we do not have in this country at the moment, unfortunately. Active palliation is real active palliation. You just support the patient's comfortable death. So that is the most appropriate at this stage, even if the patient is me. Uh, it's very difficult for this part of the uh, world to accept this, I think probably because of cultural and religious reasons. And this is why, of course, we are, I think, uh, anyway, that's uh, I'll just... Uh, not going to detail, but it's it's quite unacceptable because we we waste quite a lot of resources uh, and we actually compromise uh, the patients uh, who uh, can have a better life with neurosurgical interventions because we are sacrificing most of the some of the resources for these unsalvageable patients because of various reasons because of personal beliefs, societal pressure politicians, pressure, all those things are being operated in decision making, which we try not to do, to be honest. Uh, but uh, that's a very scientific thing, uh, very difficult to uh, uh, get others to realize that. Uh, and in developed world, what happens is these patients are going into organ donation. I wouldn't talk anything beyond uh, these two words here because neurosurgeons are prohibited of talking about organ donation. So other relevant specialties should actually implement active palliation for neurosurgical patients who are presenting at decompensated phase of increased intracranial pressure so that the transplant surgeons will benefit, not transplant surgeons, patients who are waiting for organs will benefit, but I wouldn't talk anything uh, about that beyond this uh, level. Uh, so that's all what I wanted to tell actually. Those are the very basic principles uh, and it's uh, clinical applications uh, which we generally uh, use and practice in clinical uh, environment. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shula. Um, if there are any questions, uh we can get the audience to ask or you can ask through the chat box. Um, just to ask you a question, not on the management, but regarding your experience, uh, yeah. you now you're a uh, neurosurgeon at the LRH. Uh, what is the main cause for pediatric groups to get the, uh, get an ICD? Yeah. Yeah. Mainly what, we encounter is uh, uh, brain tumors and congenital neural tube defects. Those are the two common causes of increased intracranial pressure that we uh, frequently encounter in pediatric neurosurgical practice because one thing is, of course, Allegri Hospital is a draining center for the whole country. So we uh, receive quite a lot of patients. Uh, it's not that the other neurosurgical cannot handle those, but the workload uh, is pretty much high. So sometimes, uh, this acts as a draining center. So I get quite a lot of patients with congenital neural tube defects. Uh, these congenital neural tube defects are uh, very frequently associated with aqueduct stenosis. Uh, so we know aqueduct is the uh, drainage point for uh, both ventricles of cerebral hemispheres. And once that is blocked, uh, 
uh, CSF uh, distribution is disturbed. So this is one of the very frequent cause of increased intracranial pressure that we see. And it's very almost always it's surgical. The management is surgical. Then of course, tumors. Tumors also I need to mention a little bit because most of the time in pediatric group, we see tumors in the posterior fossa. That's below the tentorium. And this is the compartment within the cranial cavity which can easily cause increased intracranial pressure because the compartment is quite, uh, 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 volume is quite less and it's quite packed and the, the exit points of uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid from within the brain is all they are in the uh, posterior fossa. So if you have increased intracranial pressure features, we always image the patient, uh, child children to see if there is a posterior fossa lesion and this is very common in uh, pediatric practice and I am just here for two months and I nearly we have done around 20 tumors I suppose. Oops, trauma so... is quite less. The reason for the trauma to be quite less I think we have probably we are more cautious when it comes to children. <laughs> okay thank you very much. There are two uh questions in the chat box. Uh, Virendra Prayer wants to know, uh, why should mannitol be avoided in ICH to reduce ICP? I should want to mention that. I said now in the second phase, the medical management, two hyposmal agents we use frequently is mannitol and hypertonic saline. Now, I think the hypertonic also, we use only 3% saline because the, we have uh, up to 20%. But if you are uh, using higher concentration, we need to have a central line to give it. Otherwise, uh, it causes quite a lot of uh, peripheral venous problems. So what we use is 3% saline and mannitol. Uh, both are effective uh, bring in bringing down uh, uh, intracranial pressure. But only thing is mannitol has osmotic properties different from uh, hypertonic saline. Because it's being a colloid, it can extra vasate. And uh, that can drag uh, uh, water and uh, cause expansive lesion, expand, expand lesion with uh, uh, some degree of uh, expansibility. Now, this is what happens in trauma when you have a blood clot and if you give mannitol, of course, the, the ICP will drop down because it reduces cerebral pressure. Uh, cerebral edema, but if the mannitol extra vasate into the clot and that will attract more fluid and your clot will actually expand, which we call mannitol bleeding. So if you have a patient with increased intracranial pressure and you suspect a hemorrhagic intracranial pathology, I do not advise giving mannitol. Okay. Whereas in hypertonic saline, that property is not there. So even if you are clueless whether it is a hemorrhagic pathology or not, you can use hypertonic saline. The thing is, metabolic complications are quite high in mannitol because it causes osmotic diuresis. So, patient can be hypovolemic after some time and that can cause more cerebral ischemia, whereas that is also not seen in hypertonic saline. So, what I suggest is you always use hypertonic saline, not mannitol, because especially if you don't know if it is hemorrhagic or non hemorrhagic. If you know that it's a non hemorrhagic, you can use mannitol, not a problem, if you provided that you are. Uh, able to detect and manage metabolic complications. Uh, and if you have a hemorrhagic pathology, still there is a place for mannitol. If you have the facility to take the patient to neurosurgical theatre within 30 minutes, which means I think peripheral units can't do that. This can only be done uh, when the patient is at a neurosurgical centre because you can give mannitol that will bring down the pressure and that will buy time. But there's a possibility that the clot can be expanded. So the patient should be able to go into neurosurgical theater generally within 30 minutes. That's the only indication I would say you give mannitol uh, in the hemorrhagic intracranial pathology. Okay. I think you give quite a comprehensive answer to that. Uh, so another question is, does steroid used in hemor uh, uh, is steroid used in hemorrhagic strokes? Uh, it's like this. I said this. Now we have two types of cerebral edema. One thing is the cytotoxic edema. Other thing is the vasogenic edema. Uh, I think that's a, a separate topic. So I, I just I will just narrow down to your question. Now in hemorrhage, uh, depending on the primary pathology, uh, what you generally get is the cytotoxic type of edema, even if it is a trauma or a, a stroke. Uh, to begin with, it's a cytotoxic edema. So there is no place for uh, uh, steroids. Uh, 
but what happened is uh, in the evolution of bleeding uh, there is breakdown products which can cause cerebral edema and irritation of uh, endothelium of the cerebral circulation secondarily which can cause uh, vasogenic edema so that is why you might see some of the neurosurgeons prescribe uh, uh, dexa uh, steroids uh, in the process of evolution of a hematoma, not immediate, in the acute stage. Well, let's say you get a stroke today, I, there is no place for a steroid. But in day three, if you do a CT, you will see some perilational edema. That's because of secondary vasogenic component. And uh, for that, of course, there is a place for um, steroids. But primarily for hemorrhagic pathologies, uh, uh, in trauma and stroke, uh, in acute stage, there is no place for Okay. Uh, there are three more questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, what is the prophylactic antileptic of choice in cases of raised ICP? Mm -hmm. And does the underlying cause affect the choice? Yes, it does. But in general, uh, use of prophylactic anticonvulsants are now being uh, massively discouraged because uh, the reason is, uh, in uh, this actually depends on the primary pathology, uh, but most of the time uh, we, we like starting uh, anticonvulsants uh, when there is first episode of clinical convulsion or EEG evidence of subclinical convulsions because then we know it's definitely therapeutic. Uh, uh, prophylactically in selected situations, uh, uh, depending on the personal preference, uh, uh, we start and some of the neurosurgeons actually are still, I mean, it's quite routine for them. Uh, but I think that decision has to come from neurosurgeons. So the primary physician should always consult either neurosurgeon or a neurologist to see if there is a place for prophylactic anticonvulsions because that has to be a customized decision for that particular patient. So if in vast majority nowadays, we do not recommend uh, uh, prophylactic anticonvulsions. Indications are there, but it's, it's too technical. So I won't sort of elaborate on this. But particularly, I would say in trauma, that I think that's what probably they're asking. In trauma, there is no place for prophylactic anticonvulsions according to most of the experimental and clinical evidences. Uh, sometimes, uh, of course, uh, uh, some of our senior neurosurgeons still use it because that has been traditionally used. So you might see a completely different practice for what I say. But if you see NIVAS guidelines and the standard practice, particularly in UK, I'm quite sure in Australia too, uh, they do not uh, adv uh, ad uh, advise giving prophylactic anticonvulsions in trauma until you get... Uh, first clinical convulsion or EEG evidence of subclinical convulsions. So best thing would be to consult a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. Okay. Uh, thank you. Then uh, fourth question is in children with cerebral abscesses, uh, when are we or when should one go for surgical interventions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, that because traditionally cerebral abscesses were considered a neurosurgical emergency. Uh, it's it's actually to be on uh, on a very theoretical ground because in clinical practice we have seen uh, enough patients uh, with cere massive cerebral abscess who are clinically very well uh, and in fact there are very little clinical features to say that there is increased intracranial pressure even and sometimes they don't have it. Uh, so in theory of course that's the emergency because only concern is that can rupture. Uh, into ventricles causing ventriculitis or it can cause generalized CSF sepsis. But this phenomena is quite rare. So that is why now the, I think this question comes because sometimes we get referrals saying that there are cerebral abscess at the middle of the night and primary physician's concern is why we are not operating urgently in the middle of the night. And this is actually not done in some centers, of course, it's done, but it's being discouraged. It's not a super emergency as we thought before, because the if you look at the evolution, they stay quite stable uh, uh, to a uh, you know uh, greater period of time. So that is why if you refer a patient cerebral abscess at night, we might uh, get out the patient next day and do it. So it's not a very uh, it's considered emergency, but it's not a super emergency as we thought before. Uh, then the final question is, um, can you elaborate on spentis D or serotopeptidase and tranexamic acid in, in, I suppose, in 
increased ICD. Yeah, and we, we have evidence only for uh, uh, tranexamic acid that is also mainly in trauma. Uh, this was actually studied in, uh, there are multiple studies done in large scale. I think the biggest one must be the crash trial. Uh, they have uh, 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 given some evidence uh, towards uh, positive effects of giving tranexamic acid in trauma because that uh, decreases uh, uh, the hemorrhagic the propagation of hemorrhages because it, uh, uh, it basically stops bleeding. Uh, but for uh, other hemorrhagic pathologies such as uh, uh, strokes, uh, it, it can stop bleeding to a certain extent, uh, but its uh, deleterious effects also can be quite significant. Uh, uh, why I am selling, telling this is, in, if you look at the histopathology uh, of uh, brain parenchyma uh, in patients uh, who, who are given uh, tranexamic acid, almost all single capillaries inside the brain is thrombosed when they are. So there is significant contribution to microcirculatory dysfunction uh, with tranexamic acid. So it's, it has to be balanced. I think uh, there are evidence in trauma, but in non-trauma situations, we would probably avoid giving tranexamic acid because if the patient already has microcirculatory dysfunctions in brain parenchyma, with this tranexamic acid induced thrombosis, it's going to be uh, worse. But in trauma, you can give. Thank you very much. So if there, if you have any feedback uh, for Dr. Shula's lecture, please uh, send it privately and I will be sharing it with uh, him. And already I think uh, there is Anuka who is uh, commenting that uh, happy to see you giving the lecture and happy to be a member in the team at Gaul. So I think that's uh, a message for you. Uh, and uh, just a reminder about our next um, Saturday talk. It will be held uh, on July 26th and we are hoping to get Dr. Lakmal Fonseca, uh, a lecturer in, in the medical department, medicine department at, uh, from Ruhuna Medical Faculty. So uh, I want to now thank uh, Dr. Chola for spending his uh, Saturday uh, with us uh, and spending more than one and a half hours uh, going through this uh, very important topic. And I think uh, Dr. Shula is uh, high, in a highly specialized area in surgery. And I think we are very grateful that he is in Sri Lanka and uh, providing his services to those who need it. And also you know, trying to teach, not trying to teach, but teach uh, the younger generation. So thank you very much. Kudos to you, Dr. Shula, for a very interesting lecture and a very, uh, I think, a very detailed lecture about uh, ICP management. Uh, and thank you very much. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Okay, thanks a lot.